Aloha, I'm Lila Berg. Mahalo for tuning in to Island Focus. Outdoor activities and sports in particular are an integral part of our lives in Hawaii. We're recording this program remotely so that you can hear from leaders of organizations that are guiding youth sports on Oahu. Mahalo for joining us on Island Focus. Aloha Ray, and thank you for joining us. It's been quite a while since you were student teaching at Kailua Intermediate <laughs> when I was there. It feels like yesterday, but I realized I did the math. It's been a while. And now you have the breadth of the OIA in your embrace and all the athletic directors of every public high school. Can you share with us where are sports now in our public schools and give us a little glimpse of you know, that maybe the challenges you've come through and definitely some hope for the future. Our focus this this year, this school year, was to try and salvage at least the spring sports. The pandemic started in the spring last year, so the athletes who are now participating in the OIA did not have a season last year. And we did not want that to occur again. We wanted these student athletes, of course, the senior didn't you know, get that chance to experience it, but for us to postpone it you know, two years in a row, that was, that was really our focus. So, and it's occurring right now, we're just completing our first week of competition and you know, it's been going pretty good. As a physical education teacher, which is your credentials, when we talk about sports in high school, What's your perspective on that? Sports is so important to a population of students. That can be the driving force in order for them to get to places that they would never have dreamed of if they weren't participating. However, it's not always the case for all student athletes. You know, I know that the emphasis today is on scholarships and getting to a pro contract. You know, to me, that my personal philosophy, that kind of is skewing, you know, high school athletics today. The experience and, you know, the participation in athletics and the rigor of sticking to teamwork and all the different intangibles that you get outside of the classroom is, is far more valuable and important than striving to be a college athlete or a pro athlete. It's only a small percentage of student athletes that reach that that pinnacle. So I do not want that perception of whoever doesn't reach that, that ultimate goal as failures. I mean, whoever participates, whether you have a winning season or a losing season, you know, it cannot be deemed as failures. It's it's success all over, you know, all over, all around as a complete, you know, whole student. And I appreciate hearing that, you know, there's so much pressure on our young people to perform, to compete, to succeed. And it's about the future that sometimes I think we forget that they're kids and that the present is really what will um, launch them to the future and not the fear of what's not gonna happen. So when we talk about sports coming back, you said the spring sports, what, um, what can we anticipate that might be different in the future? Because of the quick turnaround, we finally got, you know, everything aligned to participate in workouts. The, sc the schools were starting to get face-to-face -face instruction back on campuses because without that, I don't think we would ever get to this, you know, where this level where we are now that students needed to come back in person for us to start. Our stress was get them back working out and into some kind of game or competition. But if you notice the OIA, we did not stress any wins and losses, standings, uh, championships were out. Uh, everything was just purely about participation, but with the same stringent, rigorous, you know, our coaches do a great job following these, these rules and intangibles to allow that student athlete to get whatever value of being a student athlete is still, I think, being taught. It's not being lost. Uh, if you look at our competition, even if it's a tie, 
you still see the same kind of effort, the same kind of attitude from our student athletes. And that can be attributed to the, the coaches doing a great job with that. And that's quite a transition, actually, you know, especially in this day and age of having to be better than somebody else. The fact that they're out there participating is a win in itself. The situation we're in with life now being so dramatically changed for everyone. I think back when I was that age, um, it must be so, it must be a thrill just to be out there. And, you know, I hope that continues. That that part of participating in athletics should never be lost. I mean, I'm way out of competing from in high school, but I can you know, still think back to multiple instances and games that I can, you know, reminisce. And of course, we can embellish the stories a little since no one remembers them. But, you know, but it's still there in our minds, in our hearts. And when we get together, we can always, you know, reflect back on them. As we wrap up our conversation for today, um, your thoughts to share with the audience relative to sports and encouraging our young people to get out there. You know, we're planning to have everything back, you know, going as we move along this, these um, uncertain times. But I think it's very important to remember that physical activity and athletics, you know, goes hand in hand. It's a little different when you're on a team and playing for high school. Like I said, there's no other experience like it. Um, it's not all students, but a fra you know, a fraction of students that do participate in athletics. It's going to be life lessons and things that you'll never forget. The value that you get from it is is a great value. I I think you know it's it's got me to where I am today. The mentors that I had, coaches, athletic directors, I couldn't be here without their mentorship and you know their direction. So I hope that continues. Thank you so much for your time. You know, and as you're talking about the integration, basically, of academics and athletics. It makes for a whole fabulous high school experience. Um, so thank you very much for your time and best wishes, and we'll look forward to hearing more about the OAA teams. All right, thank you. Thank you for having me. We've had the pleasure of getting to know Raymond Fujino, who is the Executive Director for the Oahu Interscholastic Association. So great to see you again, Laura. You know, you you bloom wherever you're landed. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. So now as director of Parks and Rec for the city and county of Honolulu, you have a very wide embrace. Can you share with us where we are with the parks and what you envision is possible for us? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, it's been a wonderful few months here at the Department of Parks and Recreation. I've really enjoyed um, learning about the department, meeting the staff, and meeting all the different park users. I have much to learn, but it, it's just been a, a great experience. And I guess the first thing I would say is that I think there's been a real renewed appreciation for parks, given the pandemic and what everyone's been going through over the last year. It was interesting that, you know, how many people just needed to get out to these open spaces. And, and I come to parks from having been at the Department of Land and Natural Resources. And, you know, I have a real appreciation for the importance of these open spaces. And um, some of them are cultural lands, but just access to recreation, opportunity to get out of, you know, hot, small, multi-generational houses into the open air, down to our beaches. You know, this is, this is why we live here. And people have been coming out in droves during the pandemic. We run not just the city parks, but also the five botanical gardens. And Ho'omalahia had been keeping tabs of the number of people coming in, which was ticking up quite a lot under the tourism increased numbers. Their attendance numbers went up when tourism shut down because so many local residents started saying, okay, where can I go? And then remembering, hey, we've got this fantastic botanical garden. I'm going to go walk there. And, and so it's been wonderful to see residents getting out and remembering our parks and 
and our gardens. And we've been really happy to be a part of that. It warms my heart as well because we have 24 seven beautiful weather usually. And now when we look at the future of parks, now you know you're aware or we're aware that the, the public enjoys being in parks. What do you foresee as the future? A couple things. Uh, the public enjoys being in the parks, but we recognize that our parks are not in the condition that we want them to be in. And so I've been talking with our trade section that does a tremendous amount of work on renovating parks, restoring them, and, and maintaining them. And what they told me is that if we didn't have to deal with vandalism, the places, you know, we could get ahead. We could make every place look better. But they are spending about 90% of their time addressing vandalism, trying to get places back into operation. Some of it is in, in intentional and some of it is just careless behavior like flushing things down toilets that break the, the pipes and close down the bathrooms for a while. I think the other challenge we have is a lot of our parks were designed back in the 1970s and 80s and maybe even 90s. And the mentality at that point is, you know, have a, a flat open field, maybe have a playground and a court. And then that's your park. It really isn't enough to drive enough people out to these parks to have them be active enough to deter the bad behavior. And so they become a little less welcoming because we don't have the facilities in the parks or the activity uh, in the park that's going to drive more people out there. And so I think that's one of the biggest changes we need to deal with on Oahu. We have a limited amount of land. And so how can we make the most of the parks that we do have to maximize the ability of people to come out to them and keep avoiding the bad behavior by activating them in that way. I think that when we think of our parks, um, organized sports, ASO, HISA, you know, come into mind. And yet, uh, walking around my park recently with my dog, there's many activities that are going on. Um, do you foresee that happening more in the future? I do. Organized sports are always going to be a big part of our culture in Hawaii and a big part of our parks. That said, there's a lot of kids who don't get into the um, kind of more elite level of play or the families that can't afford the dues of the clubs, and they want to have an opportunity to play sports. So we need to have some a little bit more disorganized sports. There's also a lot of kids and adults that are not necessarily into the competition or into different types of activities. And we want to be able to foster those as well. And I think, again, going back to this idea of activating our parks, if we want to give opportunities to everyone and we want to make sure our parks are active so we can deter bad behavior, I think it's time for us to have some hard conversations about welcoming mixed use of areas because if we have mixed use, then you have people being able to use the park all times of day. Uh, maybe during school, you know, when the kids are in school and people tend to be working and you don't have an organized sports activity, you know, you have things in a park where retired people can go and work on adult exercise equipment. You have walking paths, you know, around a field so that people can be taking laps and things and maybe find uh, better dog park areas for a lot of people that are interested in that. But, it, you know, finding ways to creatively mix and overlay different types of uses within the same park, I think, is going to be the key to um, being able to serve all our population and being able to have parks that are, are safe and healthy and welcoming environments. Well, and as we wrap up our conversation for today, what thoughts can you share with the audience in terms of participating in helping the parks to become more alive, let's say? Well, we have all of our permitted activities, so we're working now with the organized sports to reopen them. We have kept open Adopt-A-Park and other types of group activities that people may want to come out and do a program. Uh, we would like to work with people, and we're trying to expand that to have other, you know, community garden type of ideas that people can take ownership and stewardship over over the long term. So again, it's finding ways to work with the community. These parks are our parks. It, you know, they don't belong to the city. They certainly don't belong to me. And so what we want to do is have more community involvement in the parks and uh, help make those ideas come to fruition. 
Well, it's certainly refreshing to see people out and about right now. Um, and for myself as well, to be out in the fresh air. Um, and I hope that you're enjoying the parks as well, personally. I am getting to go to a lot of the parks as part of my job, so it's one of the benefits, and so I am really enjoying it. There's there's a, little, a lot of things around the island, even though I grew up here and have lived here most of my life, that uh, you know I haven't seen, so it's really neat to go out and see them now. Well, thank you very much for your continued service to our community and um, also for your enthusiasm now to get to know the parks a little better. It's a privilege to be in the job. Mahalo for joining me in my conversation with Laura Thielen, who is the director of the Honolulu City and County Department of Parks and Recreation. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, Greg. Thank you, great to be here with you. You know, the YMCA's, all the locations, uh, the whole program offers so much to families. Can you share with us where you are right now, how you've gone through the last few months and what we can look forward to? So of course the last uh, year has been a time of uh, change and uh, lots of different uh, obstacles as well as different needs from the community. So uh, last year when we started with lockdowns and close downs, et cetera, uh, the Y looked at the community and asked the question, what is it that the community needs from us now? And what can we do to be helpful? So one of the important things that's relevant to this conversation was we started to offer childcare and distant learning kids and the parents who were the first responders. They needed to go to work, school wasn't in session. Where do they take their kids? They couldn't take them to you know, the front lines to do their job. So we took our centers, which needed to be closed for health and wellness purposes and converted many of them uh, to places where we took care of the kids during the day to help them with their studies and then provide those enrichment activities in this fun and safe environment. So all of these protocols related to COVID and uh, what you need to do for physical distancing and you know, being outdoors as much as you can, we help co-create some of those things uh, here in Hawaii because we were one of the few organizations that kept on serving uh, kids uh, throughout this period of time. And that, that extended through the summer, last summer, we offered our day camps and summer programs. And then, of course, through the fall and to today, we've been operating throughout and have figured out how to adapt our practices to be safe and welcoming. And that's what we're really good at. And, you know, this program is focusing on youth sports mm -hmm. and activities in the community. The Y has always provided athletic and enrichment activities. Can you share with us a little bit more of what you even have now going on? We've been a thought leader in sports as part of our international 177 year history. Most specifically, we invented the games of basketball and volleyball. And we were one of the first organizations to do organized swim lessons in pools. So we continue these traditions of sports here at our YMCA in Honolulu, where we've operated for 152 years. We see sports, however, in a very broad context, mm -hmm. a place where youth or adults can come together to actively participate in organized activities that help people to become or stay active, give them confidence in their abilities, learn skills, and hopefully continue to practice and play these sports throughout their lives. Our philosophy around youth sports has been around encouragement, promotion of healthy competition, rather than rivalry, uh, we see the value of participation over winning. We see team building as well as individual development. We help create positive self-image and mutual respect for others. We know that and believe that sports should be fun and engaging ways to build character through that practice of our core why values of honesty, respect, and responsibility. We see that sports in a broad sense is really crucial as part of any youth development. 
It can also be great opportunities to learn and practice communication skills, work as a team, grow their social skills and their passions. Courts can also provide a place to learn respect for authority and rules and instill a sense of responsibility. Courts really help build friendships, confidence, enhance those motor skills, critical thinking, decision-making, boosting self-worth. As you can see, you might look at a simple game of soccer and say they're kicking a ball around. The reality is, is it's much deeper and really thoughtful from a youth development perspective. And you also involve, uh, or you invite uh, community organizations. So we invite others, not only our own team, but we invite other professionals uh, who may be experts in hula, as an example, or martial arts, or other disciplines where maybe we don't have expertise. And you are the go-to location. <laughs> For sure. We have lots of locations uh, throughout Oahu uh, to serve so many communities. You know, the why in terms of what we do do, we run that gamut, martial arts, judo, karate, as well as surf and hula, and then some more of the what you think is traditional sports. We continue to bring back more of these sports as space becomes available. And right now, one of the challenges, and I know that you want to talk a little bit about you know, what are the things that we're encountering as sports uh, starts coming back is space and, and utilization, that distancing that we need to have, especially in the indoors. The second is uh, really around consumer perception and behavior. There's been so many conversations about what's open, what's closed, what you can do, what you can't do, what's safe, what's not safe. And consumers and, and parents have to wade through all of that and understand A, what are the opportunities? Where do I find them? And B, do I feel safe with them? Are my kids going to be safe? Where am I going to send them? Who do I trust? And so now we're changing that paradigm and that messaging to be something else that says you can do things safely. Thank you so much for your time and your enthusiasm and your belief in children. Thank you so much and uh, look forward to uh, engaging so many parents and kids as we move forward. You've just had the opportunity to meet Greg Weibel, who is president and CEO of YMCA Honolulu. <music> Mahalo for being with us today on Island Focus. I'm Lila Bird. On behalf of the Island Focus crew and the entire team at Alelo Community Media, Aloha and Malama Pono. Let's be kind to each other and take care of our youth. See you soon.